Welcome friends to another r slash nuclear revenge video. Today we've got a story of revenge involving breaking the very items they adore. But first, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. That said, our first story of the day is revenge against my problematic colleague. My problematic colleague went behind my back to write HR to fire me over a silly mistake I had told him in confidence. My payback almost ruined his career. I was promoted at work last year, and that was the highlight of my career that year. It was the one promotion I'd been looking forward to, and I could not wait to function in the capacity of a manager and contribute massively to the growth of the company. There were four managers in total, each in charge of different departments, and a managing director who was in charge of the managers. All managers reported directly to the director. Since I was promoted, I had to move to a floor higher. And while I was looking forward to having my own space, a luxury I didn't have on my previous floor, it was hard saying goodbye to my previous co-workers on that level. They were great people, and we had a lot of fun together. Most of us even became friends from working together. I was slightly disappointed when, after I resumed work as a manager, I realized that I wasn't going to get the private office that I'd always wanted. It was such a bummer, but I decided to not think too much about it. All the managers had their private offices, but it was not so private. Before that, I had never seen an office arrangement like that. Our offices opened up to each other, so we were all in the same office, only we had makeshift walls used to create divisions. There was just one large door to get into my office. I had to pass through the offices of the first three managers, and they had to pass through each other's offices. The only person who didn't have to pass through others' offices to get to theirs was the first manager. Her office was the first anyway, so she would just walk right in. Mine, on the other hand, was the fourth and last in arrangement. I had to walk through three to get into mine. When I first came, I whined to the first manager about how I had to go through many offices. She smiled and said, Listen, you're lucky. Your office is the corner one. Think of it this way. You may have to pass through three offices, but no one ever passes through yours. Trust me, dude, it gets annoying when everyone has to pass through your office to get to theirs. Her office was the one with the large door, so she knew what she was talking about. I looked on the bright side and started to enjoy my office space until the third manager came around. Everything was perfect until he resumed work from his leave. First of all, he didn't like that I got the corner office. He went on and on about how he had called the corner office. He complained to me and to anyone else who cared to listen, and at some point, I wanted to grab him by the throat and shove him away. Who even calls anything and lays claim to it just by calling? Were we in high school? He'd been eyeing the seat and didn't like that I got it instead of him. At first, I was quite apologetic about that. I knew how it felt to not get something you badly wanted, so when he was passive-aggressively mentioning that he wanted my office, I jokingly apologized and we moved past it. Or so I thought. Not only was he a very controlling jerk, but he was also rude, condescending, and extremely competitive. The other managers hated him, and even the team he manages couldn't stand him, and while they understood their reason, I still felt their hatred for him was not justified and was not proportional to his immature behavior. One day, I was speaking with the first manager and I told her this. I know he's a little bit too much, but I don't think he deserves this much hate. She laughed and shook her head. Listen, that guy is a nightmare. I hate him so much, I wouldn't mind a truck hitting him on his way to work tomorrow. She continued laughing. I felt her comment was a bit extreme, said goodbye to her and left for home. On my way home, I wondered what he might have done to deserve so much bile from the other managers and his subordinates. I knew he was competitive and childish, even when there was no competition, he would just try to outshine everyone, and it was very obvious how he would put others down to make himself look good. I minored in psychology at the university, so I figured his behavior was informed by the kind of childhood he had. He probably had parents who compared him with his siblings, and that's why he grew up to be competitive and unnecessarily combative. Apart from the fact that the other managers would say terrible things about him behind his back, they never invited him for happy hour or said anything around him. They would hide even the smallest details of work and their personal lives from him, and I never understood why until much later. I asked the first manager though, and she advised me to ask the other manager why they did all that. At some point, it looked like they were bullying him. He was treated like a pariah. 
I noticed how hurt he would look when one of the managers would invite the others for something and simply act like he wasn't there. I felt very bad for him and decided I was going to befriend him just so he wouldn't feel so left out and also to see if I can get him to stop his high school jerk behavior. I started to talk more to him and invite him to come out with us for a drink after work. I knew my other colleagues didn't like that, but I did it anyway. He would hang out with us and I tried to get everyone talking to one another, but it was awkward so I stopped and just stuck to talking to him without trying to carry others along. We soon became quite cordial and I noticed he relaxed on the high school jerk thing even though he was still competitive and tried to outshine everyone when the director was around. Something happened months later and this changed how I saw him and our budding friendship. The director called a meeting for the manager's performance review and he praised my work and that of my team. He was proud of the work I had done well and he encouraged me to continue. The other managers were glad for me and we shook hands, but my colleague who I thought was well on the way to being a close friend was visibly disturbed. All through that day, he was irritated and went around with a long face. I tried to find out what was wrong, but he wouldn't even speak to me. I figured something personal must have happened and I let it go. I told my girlfriend back home about it and she said he was probably jealous of the good review I got from the director. I refused to believe that because he had gotten a good review too. In fact, he mostly gets a good review at work. The only issue anyone had had with him was his bad behavior. Other than that, he did a good job at work and even worked hard to look better than all of us. My girlfriend, however, pointed out that he may be angry because he sees me as a threat. I considered what she said and felt even worse for him. It must be tragic to live one's life like that, constantly worrying that you would be replaced. After that weekend, he was back to his usual friendly self and we started to speak again. One of the employees in my team was missing in action for a whole week without notifying me and I was upset about it. I ought to write a written warning for that but I didn't because when she came back, she explained what had happened. She had been feeling overwhelmed and needed time to care for her mental health. I understood what that felt like and warned her verbally to never repeat such. Unfortunately, she did it again and this time tried to appeal to me to not write her a warning. When I spoke to someone else on my team, I found out it was a habit for her and the previous manager had issued her two warnings. I decided I had to write a third warning so human resources could call her in, but I forgot to do that. I didn't even think much about it because it was a busy week until the end of the week. I was telling the difficult colleague about how I made a silly mistake of not writing her a warning and how I'd made another one and we both complained about how some team members can drive one up a wall. The next week's Tuesday, I was invited by HR and questioned on why I didn't report the lady in my team. I knew it was my friend who had reported me and I couldn't bring myself to understand why he would do that. It couldn't have been anyone else because I hadn't told anyone else. When I left HR's office, I went straight to his office and confronted him. He refused to answer my questions for a while, but later he looked up at me and said, People like you make people like me look bad cutting slacks all the time and trying to get people to like you. He said it coldly and quietly, almost in a whisper. I went to my office with a new understanding of why the other managers liked to keep him out of their conversations. I was grateful that HR only let me off with a warning and didn't consider it something enough to deserve any serious attention. The next day, the director calls us all for a brief meeting and gave a long speech on how ensuring we carried out protocols with our team members was vital. You're not here to make anybody like you, he kept repeating this. After the meeting, he asked me to wait behind and informed me that someone had recommended me for dismissal. I was shocked because I didn't do anything so grievous and since I knew who it was, I kept wondering what I had done to him to deserve that. It was so silly because I was his only friend at work. The others hated him and some even avoided me because I was friendly with him. I had thought everyone was exaggerating his bad behavior, but it turned out they were right about him. You may leave, and I'm going to let you off this time, but this cannot happen again, he warned sternly. I apologized and promised that it was never going to happen again. Naturally, I began to avoid my colleague like everyone else, and he continued being a combative freak. When the other managers noticed I was avoiding him, they asked me why and laughed very hard when I told them what had transpired. They told me about how he had got the manager I replaced suspended and how the guy had to quit when he had enough of our difficult colleague. 
I wasn't surprised. If he could do that to me, then I was certain he's capable of a lot worse. I asked the other managers why they never bothered to get revenge, and they replied they didn't know how to. He did his work perfectly anyway, and no one had the time to go about sniffing to see what he was doing right or wrong. Fast forward to almost a month after, fortune smiled brightly on me. I was out on a Friday night date with my girlfriend when I saw my jerk colleague with a lady that looked very familiar. The two were arm in arm, kissing and feeding each other ice cream. It would have been cute if he wasn't a jerk. I tried looking closely and intently, but I still couldn't figure out where I had seen her before. While we were in the middle of dinner, I suddenly exclaimed, Yes! A few people at the restaurant turned, and my girlfriend rolled her eyes at me. She said, What is it? I say, I know. She says, Well, what do you know? I told her about the jerk I had seen earlier, and how I had finally been able to place where I had seen the lady he was with. She was someone I knew at work, and she was on the jerk's team. I had a good laugh all night while my girlfriend just shook her head at how petty I was. Dating a subordinate at work was heavily frowned upon at the company. It's totally against the rules, and it was a rule set up to prevent exploitation of junior colleagues by senior ones. It certainly didn't help that he was having an amorous relationship with a member of his team and that the lady is a lot younger than he was. The next Monday, I was ready and eager to go about my revenge mission. I started writing to HR as soon as I settled in my office. When I was done, I took the letter to HR myself, even though we had staff whose job was to carry documents and that sort of thing around. I wanted to tell the other managers about it, but I had to let HR invite him first. I was speaking to the first manager about some software in her office when I saw the lady I had seen with Mr. Jerk pass by her office. I could not help myself and I revealed what I'd done to the first manager. She was so excited and we laughed together about it. I know we were mean, but so was he, so we didn't care. Who would have thought little Mr. Perfect could have done a thing like that, she said to the other manager who had just walked in. We all watched the lady leave the office with a gloomy face and smiled knowingly at one another. Mr. Jerk was just behind her. HR had most likely invited them for a chat. I'm quite petty, so I decided to wait for Mr. Jerk in his office. When he returned, he looked visibly angry. His eyes were red and his eyebrows tensed. Hello, I flashed him a big grin. What are you doing in my office? He screamed. I said, well, calm down. People like you make people like me look bad. He says, you reported me. You're so mean. It was hilarious hearing the king of mean call me mean. I went back to my office, still grinning. Turns out bullies never want a taste of their own medicine. A panel sat on the matter for weeks to decide what they would do to him while his trial was going on. He was as meek as a mouse. He stopped talking over others at meetings and trying to talk himself up while criticizing others. He went around hanging his head low in shame. I felt so good about what I did because if it was him who had caught someone else, he would have done just the same or even worse. I think it's really interesting here that OP tried to break down the psychology of it. And I think honestly it was really nice that they tried to look past it and engage them. But I think it goes to show that with some people, even when you try to put your best foot forward, it's not really possible to, I guess you would say, save them. Do you guys think that despite the potential upbringing and history that led them to acting out this way, that they still deserve the boot and the outcasting from their fellow co-workers? Let me know what you guys think down in the comments. And our final story of the day is he hurt me, so I broke his Ed Sheeran vinyl collection. Don't let their smiles fool you, nice boys are just as big jerks as playboys, and I learned that the hard way. My ex-boyfriend and I were together for three years before I met this boy, let's call him Steve, because he hates Steve Rogers, and that's just another stupid fact I know about him because I was in too deep, but I'm jumping the gun so let me dial it back. I and my ex-boyfriend went to high school together, but we didn't start dating till senior year, and at every point in the relationship, I knew I was the one he settled for because he was the star player who had gotten injured a month in his senior year, and I was the ugly duckling who started glowing up right around the same time. This never bothered me, I just wanted a relationship, and he wasn't necessarily unkind to me while we were dating, we just had a mutual understanding, and for a while that worked. Until Steve showed me that it wasn't supposed to be that way. To be honest, I would have much preferred to live life alone and happy by myself without Steve's intrusion, but my life doesn't have a lot of happy endings, so I'll just be glad that I got my revenge. 
I was in my third year of college when I met Steve. He was a graduate assistant in a forensic science class I was taking for the fall semester, and I adored his nerd-like appearance from the first time I saw him. Steve wore glasses with these twisted iron frames that were so cool, and when the professor introduced him to the class, I remember feeling bad because he looked so nervous at that moment. When I went to get the details for my first lab assignment, the professor wasn't around and it was just Steve. I complimented his glasses and he complimented my hairstyle. I had about three shades of green dyed into my black hair as highlights. Steve and I were friends for a month when he made the first comment about my relationship with my ex. We were having lunch with some of the other extra lab students, and he asked me quietly, How long have you guys been dating? I told him it was three years, but I also told him that was a random question, and he said it had been on his mind to ask, but he didn't really know how to present it. And I understood that because he was incredibly socially awkward, like me. I didn't push the conversation, and I didn't think about what he said until a few days later. My ex had come to pick me up from the lab, and he was being difficult about waiting for five minutes so I could record the findings of a test I was running. Steve was sitting a few feet away, and I saw him look up at us and shake his head. That was the moment I really started to question my relationship and have a second look at things I accepted as normal. Steve didn't make any comment about that situation, but two weeks later, while I was helping him carry some textbooks to the professor's freshman science class, He asked me, why are you with him? And I didn't have an answer. So I laughed and told him that he asked the most awkward questions at the most awkward times. He also laughed and told me that he was going to watch a Marvel movie that was playing that afternoon. I asked if I could tag along because I was free and he seemed satisfied like that was the response he wanted. But I didn't realize this till later. At the moment, I just thought he was relieved to not have to go alone. It was at the movie I realized that he was obsessed with anti-heroes. He couldn't stand pure characters like Steve Rogers, and he could explain the validity of characters like Thanos for hours. He was telling me about Tony Stark as we left the cinema when I realized that I was starting to have a crush on him. And I knew it was bad news, but only because I had a boyfriend. Of course, I didn't tell him anything, but for the next couple of weeks... Every time he remembered my coffee order, brought me an extra muffin, or helped me figure out a complex lab reading, I would mentally compare him to my ex-boyfriend, and imagine what life would be like if I were dating Steve instead. Then he told me he had a crush on me, and I knew things were about to get bad, but I didn't know how bad. When Steve told me he had a crush on me, I knew I couldn't tell him I was starting to feel the same for him, not while I had a boyfriend. So I told him that I appreciated him telling me, but I had a boyfriend and I loved my boyfriend. Now I realized that my mistake was in not telling him I didn't like him, because my response seemed to motivate him to apply pressure. And he did. For a month after he told me about his feelings, Steve brought me forget-me-not flowers. He didn't say anything, just dropped them wherever he saw me, and settled into random conversation. Even after I passed and left the forensic science class, he would call me to hang out somewhere on the campus, and when I showed up, he would be holding a bunch of blue or purple forget-me-nots. My ex was starting to get suspicious, but I told him it was an inside joke because Steve and I were no longer working together in the lab, and he didn't want me to forget him as a friend. Of course, to his supersized ego, my ex wasn't worried about Steve and he simply shrugged it off. Then Steve sent me a picture of my ex and one of the girls he worked with at a sneaker store in the mall. The girl had resumed about two weeks ago, and my ex had told me he was basically training her for checkout duty. They were literally all over each other in the back office of the store, and I recognized it instantly because my ex hooked up with me in that same office. I don't know when I started crying, and I called Steve to ask him how. He told me he was checking out the store because I told him my ex was the assistant manager, and when he saw the girl taking my ex to the back, he followed them. And that was it. I confronted my ex that night and screamed at him for hurting me like that. His response was, I was only with you because it felt good for my ego. It doesn't anymore. I slapped him and left his apartment. I cried all the way back to the dormitory. Steve called me an hour later and asked if I wanted to hang out at his place. It was 10 p.m. I had never met with him that late in the night and I'd never been to his place before, but I was lonely and sad so I called a cab and went. Steve was a shoulder to cry on, and he allowed me to slobber all over his knit blanket that night. He showed me his vinyl collection, and I thought he was cute. 
He told me he was obsessed with Ed Sheeran's music, and I thought he was cute. He reminded me that he still had feelings for me, and it hurt him that I was hurting, and I thought he was cute. So, like a true idiot, I kissed him, but it didn't go any further than that. He stopped me and told me he didn't want our first time together to be tainted with memories of my ex. I thought that was the most adorable thing ever, and I told him I was stupid for wasting all that time with my ex when I knew he liked him. It was like I was saying everything right. He couldn't stop smiling. And that's when the second phase of this story picks up. Steve didn't ask me out officially, but we were practically dating. Movies, date nights, and tons of making out. It was great. Then he started repeating some of the things my ex used to say to me all the time. And that's what made me pause. If I complained about something in one of my classes being too difficult, and it was something he understood, he would say, An average brain can't handle a lot of information, in the most condescending way. If I got something nice for myself, he would ask why I felt the need to be validated by my appearance. If I talked about planning a trip with my group of friends from high school, he would remind me that I wasn't the most financially stable in the group, and ask if I didn't feel inferior next to them. For context, one of my friends was employed as an editor in an online magazine in her first year of college, and she was making enough to rent a penthouse. Of course, I know about my shortcomings and insecurities, but to have them put on blast like that was a blow to my ego every time. And then he did one of the worst things imaginable. First, I thought I would surprise him with lunch in the professor's office, because the professor was away on leave and he was basically in charge. I was almost at the office when I noticed that the door was open and I could hear his voice. He was talking with one of the other graduate assistants and he told them, The ones who are smart are also lazy, like OP, who was taking extra lab credits last semester. She never actually did anything herself. Immediately, I left. I'd asked him for help with some of the work, but nothing that was substantial to have him talk about me like that. Matter of fact, he insisted that we all ask him for help because it was a relearning process for him. When he called later that day, I agreed to see him and I immediately asked about it. He didn't try to deny that he said it, but his explanation was that he was trying to develop friendships with some of the graduate assistants and he knew that guy didn't like me, so he had to say what he said in that way. I was so shocked that I kept staring at him in silence. He thought it was okay to throw me under the bus because he was trying to make friends? I got up immediately and left. I didn't speak to him for a week, and he kept pestering me with calls. I finally gave in when he showed up to my dorm with a huge bouquet of forget-me-nots. He apologized. He said he would never speak to the guy again if that would help him get back in my good graces. He asked me to be his girlfriend, and he dropped the L word. In all honesty, I didn't know what to say, so I told him I'd like to think about it, and I accepted the flowers, so it wouldn't seem like I was mad at him, but I needed to think about it clearly. I called one of my friends who knew about the whole situation with me, my ex, and Steve. She felt like there were too many red flags I was choosing to ignore, and as soon as she said it, I knew I couldn't be with Steve. It was going to end up in a bad place for me, and I didn't want that. But I was still feeling bummed out, so I went to the mall to watch a movie, and on my way out, I walked past the store where my ex works, and I recognized the girl who was in the picture with him. I was so busy staring at her that it took my brain a minute to recognize that she was arguing with someone, and that person was Steve. I didn't know when I entered the store and walked up to them. I was almost standing right behind Steve when she hissed at him, and I heard her saying, So that was all you wanted all along? Something in my mind told me that I wouldn't know everything if I stood there, so I ran back out and stood on the opposite aisle watching them. A few minutes later, Steve walked out of the store, shaking his head, and the girl was pacing at the checkout counter. I went back into the store, and I knew she recognized me immediately, although we'd only met each other once, a week after she started working there, back when my ex and I were still together. As soon as she saw me, she sighed and told me to give her a minute. We stepped out of the store, and she turned and started with, Your ex was a jerk, but Steve's just as bad. Then she explained how Steve approached her a few days after she started working at the store, and told her that I was a terrible girlfriend to his friend, my ex, and that he knew my ex liked her but wouldn't do anything because he was in a relationship with me. She was attracted to my ex, so she laid it on thick, and my ex was pretty agreeable. She and Steve had become friends of sorts, and when he asked her how things were going, she told him she was going to have some fun with my ex that day, and that's how Steve was able to get the picture he sent to me. 
She realized that Steve had set the whole thing up when my ex told her that I'd shown him a picture of the two of them and he didn't know how I was able to get it. Then she asked my ex if he was friends with anyone named Steve and when he said that Steve had been hanging around me a lot, everything clicked for her. Nothing happened between them after that, but she still wasn't sure how far Steve had planned to carry on whatever it was he was hoping to get out of the breakup between me and my ex. So she didn't confront Steve. But earlier that day, that's the day I saw her and Steve and she and I had this conversation. She saw Steve holding hands and laughing with someone in the food court. When he saw her, he obviously panicked and came up to the store about an hour later. He told her that he had never had anything to do with me and just wanted to get my ex out of my life because he was toxic. She was already believing him, but then he said she wouldn't even sleep with me or be my girlfriend despite everything. And that's when she'd said, so that was all you wanted all along? Steve tried to take back his words, but she was done with the conversation and furious. When she finished recounting everything and apologized for allowing herself to be used to hurt me, I was shaking with rage. I thanked her for her honesty and I called Steve as I was leaving the mall. I told him I'd thought about everything and I would like to see him so we can discuss our relationship. He agreed and we set up a date at his house. As soon as I got there, I told him, you are insecure, selfish, manipulative, staying with my ex was a stupid decision, but you are the worst mistake I've ever made. And I went directly for his vinyl collection, ignoring his shouts of no and oh my god, please no. I picked up the stack of Ed Sheeran vinyls first and I slammed them on my knees one after the other. His face was red, but I could care less. I broke every single vinyl record that was in his apartment and then I told him, you can send me a bill for them, but just know that you are dead to me and it's only a villain that hates the hero. It's been two months and I haven't heard from him since. I also haven't dated anyone because the mere thought of talking to a man makes me want to puke right now. But every time I remember the feeling of smashing those stupid vinyls, I smile. I got payback in the way I wanted to and that's all that matters to me. Honestly, having heard a lot of people's opinions on Ed Sheeran and their music, a lot of people might say that you did them a favor by breaking those records. In all seriousness though, this dude was absolutely twisted and it's like a weird foreshadowing thing with the whole Thanos did nothing wrong stuff. It's kind of impressive that OP managed to weave that into the final discussion there. I don't know if anybody actually deserves to have their possessions broken over being a total jerk, but I'm definitely not going to complain about it, I'll tell you that much. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another revenge story that was absolutely crazy, click on that left video. Or if you missed my latest video, check out the one on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.